Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Nate Fain. Tonight we're looking at how sports intersects with our community. From a successful Final Four bid to how boxing helps patients diagnosed with Parkinson's. One week after the NFL announced the Super Bowl's return to the Valley, NCAA officials came to town as the region hopes to bring the Final Four back as well. Cronkite News reporter Stephanie Shields explains how Phoenix could once again be a mecca for championship sports. From 2015 to 2017, the Valley hosted the Super Bowl, the College Football National Championship game, and the Final Four. But now, Phoenix has its eyes set on another string of championships. The Super Bowl is set for 2023, but the Valley hopes to bring back the Final Four sometime between the years 2024 and 2026. This region is blessed with a lot of expertise on putting together uh, large events. That's Glendale City Manager Kevin Phelps on the heels of last week's announcement that Super Bowl 57 will be played at University of Phoenix Stadium. Now, the NCAA Men's Basketball Final Four could follow the Super Bowl back to Glendale. This is a big event community and has proven uh, with Super Bowls and other big events, uh, CFP game, uh, all of that, uh, that this is a, a place that deserves a consideration for these kind of events. Phoenix, which hosted college basketball signature event for the first time last year, is currently one of seven cities vying for a future Final Four. While stadiums are a major factor for the NCAA selection committee, it goes beyond the games as they search for cities with the best fan experience potential. Valley organizers believe they proved their college basketball medal in 2017 with both the games in Glendale and the fan events in downtown Phoenix. These fans just want to come here and have a great time. And, and because some of them are traveling with families or some of the alumni are traveling with, you know, former classmates, they want to come and experience Arizona. So for us, it's really how do we change that up? What kind of experiences can we offer? We've just gone through an event in 17 and you have a track record of hosting wonderful big events in this community and have shown uh, many times that uh, you can kind of flex your muscle and get things like this done. The Phoenix Local Organizing Committee will make its final presentation to the NCAA on July 11th with the host site announcements following shortly after. In Phoenix, Stephanie Shields, Cronkite News. Following an improbable playoff run, Arizona State Junior Chun An Yu will be teeing it up at the U.S. Open starting Thursday. Our reporter Sam Hoyle met with him to discuss the amateur's biggest test. Tune on News 2018 U.S. Open appearance marks the third time a Sun Devil has qualified for the event in three years. U is also one of seven Sun Devils who will take on Shinnecock Hills on Thursday. A familiar face is also caddying for you, ASU assistant coach Armin Kirikosian. He has, um, I think, this, the skills and attributes that are required to play a golf course like that. Um, he hits it extremely far. Um, he hits it very, very high, which plays great into firm greens and kind of the U.S. Open setup. Now, while Chun En, or Kevin as he likes to go by, might be new to Shinnecock Hills in the U.S. Open, he's not new to competing at a national stage, competing at the NCAA Men's Championships this past May. Now, when Kevin's out on the golf course, his main thing is just staying relaxed. I played a couple like big tournaments before, like the professional events, and then kind of know how that feel. So um, I just really like that feel, but I try to not uh, think too much about that uh, because when I play good golf, I always not think about too much. As the ASU men's golf head coach Matt Thurman saw you both struggle and succeed throughout the fall and spring. After ending the NCAA season riding a bit of a high, Thurman thinks you is in the right frame of mind to take on the task. That's been a learning process. You know, he got a little off track this year and had to kind of refine himself that way. And Kevin plays his best when he's happy, when he smiles, when he does just soak up the moment and enjoy it and plays with a sense of humility and gratitude. Um, but I think he's in a very good place mentally right now and he knows what makes him tick. And um, one of those things is just soaking it in and enjoying the walk. You will tee off Thursday at 1241 Eastern Time alongside Wen Chong Liang and Ryan Evans. 
Nogales native Bob Baffert became just the second trainer in horse racing history to win a second Triple Crown when Justify took home the Belmont Stakes earlier this month. Reporter Stephanie Shields went down to Tucson to visit the small program at the University of Arizona where Baffert's journey to horse racing legend began. Bob Baffert graduated from the racetrack industry program at the University of Arizona in 1977. His alumni status inspires a new generation to earn an education in the business of the sport. Zach Taylor and Abel Zander grew up loving horse racing and the business behind it. This passion inspired them to pursue an education in horse racing at the University of Arizona's racetrack industry program. Once I found out that Baffert and Pletcher were uh, alums, it kind of made the program a lot more legitimate. With racing legends Bob Baffert and Todd Pletcher as graduates, the RTIP is home to a one-of-a-kind degree program that creates a pathway for students to enter the horse racing business and everything from racetrack management to horse breeding. You can just walk up to a wall of doors that are open for you when you come in here and just pick which one to go through. Horse racing has been in steady decline across the country. According to data from IBIS World, revenue at horse tracks is down more than 20% since 2008. But RTIP director Wendy Davis believes her program, whose enrollment has been relatively steady over that same time period, is well positioned to help the industry in the long term. It really needed to, to have people who understood not just the horse side of it, but also the business side and the regulatory side to keep it moving forward. The U of A Racetrack Industry Program gives students two options. They could focus either on the business side of the racehorse industry or work directly with training horses. Even though they are separate paths, you can't have one without the other. Graduates from the RTIP have seen success in diverse areas of the racing business, from the commercial manager of the Cara in Ireland, the country's largest training center, to the senior vice president of racing operations for the New York Racing Association. Every December, the RTIP hosts a seminar that attracts worldwide recognition where students can meet with the industry's most influential leaders. In the Broadcast Center, Stephanie Shields, Cronkite News. Triple Crown winner Bob Baffert is an alum of the University of Arizona's Racetrack Industry Program, but his success stems from far more than his education. Our reporter Stephanie Shields traveled down to the border to learn more about how Bob Baffert's hometown inspired his career. The legendary horse trainer Bob Baffert now has two Triple Crown wins under his belt. But Baffert appreciates his humble beginnings before he was established in the horse racing industry and started on the border town of Nogales, Arizona. From the border to the Belmont Stakes, Bob Baffert's childhood sparked his passion in what would become a legendary career. But each of Baffert's achievements in the horse racing industry stem from the way he was raised on his family ranch in Nogales, Arizona. You know, when you're when you grow up with that, you just you know you become a animal lover, and just that's what that's what I fell in love with, just being outdoor all the time and being with the horses. The Baffert Ranch started with selling chicken eggs to local grocery stores, then followed with Black Angus cattle. But Bob and his father, Bill Baffert Sr., shared the hobby of training horses. When Bob was 10, he started racing horses for his father at the Santa Cruz Fairgrounds in Sonoida. A lot of people go on and go somewhere and they don't ever look back. They don't ever look back and say, oh, well, this is where I got my start. You know, he's not one of those guys. He remembers where he got his start. Before Bob Baffert became a two-time Triple Crown winner, he got his start here at the family ranch in Nogales, Arizona. He and his father built a straightaway 400-yard racetrack right here in these pastures. He was a good trainer from the very beginning because he had been around my dad for all those years. and. Despite the large success Baffert has seen in the industry, he keeps a close relationship with his siblings and stays in touch with people who helped him along the way. It's hard to imagine coming from Nogales that this was how would I end up. Bob Baffert and his family continue to look back with pride on the way they grew up on the border and the family ranch. The Baffert Ranch is still operational today with Bob's brother Bill managing it. The family says the ranch in Nogales will always remain a place they can go back to no matter what. The next race for Bob's horse and Belmont Stakes winner Justify remains to be announced. In the Broadcast Center, Stephanie Shields, Cronkite News. 
Many NBA experts predict the Suns will select University of Arizona standout DeAndre Ayton with the first overall pick in this month's NBA draft. Ayton visited Talking Stick Resort Arena today and our Felipe Corral Jr. was there. He explains the Suns are hoping for a lot more than an upgrade in talent when they make their selection. The Phoenix Suns hope the NBA's top pick can reverse the fortunes of late. Once a hot ticket in Phoenix, the Suns have sank to the bottom of the NBA, ranking 23rd in average attendance, according to the to ESPN, and posting the league's worst record. It's made the team an easy target for people like John Oliver in Sunday's episode of Last Week Tonight on HBO. Go to a game and see if it improves your mood to see Dragon Bender put up four points and one and a half rebounds. Spoiler alert, it won't. Many have laughed at the Sun's struggles over the last several years, but a positive spotlight has shined on the team recently. It's the first time in Sun's history they own the number one overall pick in the NBA draft. It's also the first time in over 30 years the team's had a pick in the top three. It's something that's historic for the franchise, historic for the community and people who have been here for a long time and been uh, you know, lifelong Suns fans and people who have just been maybe newer Suns fans. This is something that um, they're really getting behind. A strong candidate for that top overall pick, former University of Arizona star DeAndre Ayton, who the team hosted in a private workout today. On the competitive level, I am the best competitor. Um, I don't think there's nobody like me. I play my heart on both ends of the floor. And I give it my all. I played hard through the whole season. And I think I deserve to be the number one pick. Aiton played high school and college basketball in Arizona. The chance to stay in state and play for the Phoenix Suns is an opportunity of a lifetime. Most of my family is already here in Phoenix. And, you know, we made this home since I came here in uh, high school. And, you know, we adapt to the weather, um, the people. Everybody knows us now. So, I mean, here, is, this is our second home. So we just feel welcome. Hayton averaged 20.1 points per game and 11.6 rebounds during his lone year in Tucson. The NBA draft is June 21st in New York. From, from the Broadcast Center, Felipe Corral Jr., Crankite News. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. The 2018 election season has arrived. Join us for primary and general election debates. Right here, meet the candidates and hear their positions. Arizona Horizon, your source for what matters most this election season. Only on Arizona PBS. The gaming industry has seen huge growth across the globe, and we're starting to see that impact here in Arizona. This week, the biggest names in gaming and the global community got together in Los Angeles for a massive expo. Our reporter Cariño Haro was there at E3 and joins us live now from LA. Gamers, developers, fans, and pretty much everyone else connected to the gaming industry is in Los Angeles this week for E3, an annual convention that gathers together gaming enthusiasts from around the globe. I caught up with esports marketing consultant John Pierce, who teaches the business of esports at ASU's the WP Carey School of Business, who use sports to help illustrate this massive of scope, massive scope of this event. So imagine if uh, the people who ran uh, the NFL was here, the NBA, the Major League Baseball, college football, golf, rugby, swimming, every Olympic sport, wrestling, uh, were all here and they were talking about what they were doing with their game to grow their game, all in one place, all under one roof. For years, E3 was only accessible to industry professionals, but upon opening to the general public two years ago, the event has seen a huge growth in attendance, making it one of the largest gaming conventions in the United States. This year is Tempe's gaming podcaster Josh Silverman's first time attending, and he thinks more people from Arizona should pay attention. Arizona needs to get on that radar. We have a, a little bit of a gaming community, but we need to get on that because just to build up that industry and be interested in it because it's the next wave of entertainment. According to the Entertainment Software Association, who owns and operates E3, Arizona's gaming community includes 16 college programs and 75 gaming companies. Compare that to California, with its 889 companies and 70 seven college programs. Chandler gamer Renee McArdle said while the Arizona gaming community may be relatively small, it is close-knit. Arizona has like the community is wonderful and it, it brings people together you know just from this convention I didn't realize how many people live in Arizona that are here. 
it's huge. And it's like, you live right around the corner from me practically and meeting other people from Mesa and Phoenix. And you can, it's just expanding your, your own personal community too in your own neighborhood. The event, which wraps up today, is expected to smash last year's attendance record of 68,400 people. Live from the Los Angeles Bureau, I'm Karin Yoharo, Cronkite News. Arizona is learning to become a part of the growing college esports community. Cronkite News reporter Karin Yoharo spoke to students at a recent esports competition. Collegiate esports clubs are mostly run by students who are passionate about competitive gaming and about growing their gaming community at their respective colleges. Alex Orzescu, the president of the esports club at the University of Advancing Technology in Tempe, sees plenty of room for esports growth at the collegiate level. Not enough schools are on board with the opportunities that esports does provide. And then there are also the schools that have gotten in way ahead of the competition. TESPA, an organization specializing in collegiate esports, has over 200 clubs at universities around the country with an estimated 15,000 members. Most of these clubs are like any other student group, but a select few, including Grand Canyon University's esports team, receives treatment more akin to varsity athletics, with scholarships, specialized arenas, equipment, and funding to compete in top esports events around the world. They gave us a large facility. Uh, currently, we have 25 computers, and we're going to be getting some more over this summer. Uh, for next year, we're moving into a bigger space. They're working on helping us get jerseys and sending us all over the place to do different uh, tournaments and such. A local organization more associated with big-time college football dove into the world of esports earlier this year. The Fiesta Bowl hosted the Overwatch Collegiate National Championship at Arizona State in February. They have uh, uh, a major game that's been, been played and, and, and teams throughout the collegiate world have been competing in this. There's four teams left. They need the championship home. We know how to do championships and so let's get together and do this. Fiesta Bowl officials said 1,000 people attended the event and drew an online audience of over 8,000 concurrent views, not to mention the $120,000 in scholarships awarded to the winning team. From the Cronkite News Studios, Karin Yoharo, Cronkite News. The World Health Organization is classifying excessive gaming as a disorder, a move health professionals are applauding while some from the gaming community are pushing back. Cronkite News reporter Karin Yoharo heard from both sides of the issue. Gilbert's 21-year-old Habib Matar has been an avid gamer for as long as he can remember, dedicating large portions of his day to League of Legends in addition to a full day of school. When I was 13, it really kicked off this, like, you know, as I said, maybe like five, six hours a day of gaming. Looking at it now and back then, I would say it's excessive. For some of the more than 2 billion gamers worldwide, the excessive gaming could now become part of a medical diagnosis recognized by the World Health Organization. For the first time, the WHO lists gaming disorder as a mental health condition in the latest edition of its International Classification of Diseases. Although the classification is new, its symptoms are not. Grand Canyon University psychologist Daniel Kaufman works with people for whom gaming has become much more than a hobby. They're coming to me because they're experiencing depression, anxiety, relationship conflict, or even career or academic difficulties. And they start to see the games as an obstacle or a barrier to their success. The WHO says for avid gaming to elevate to a disorder, it should be, quote, of sufficient severity to result in significant impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational, or other important areas of functioning that would normally have been evident for at least 12 months, end quote. For Matar, he wants to make sure the new classification doesn't demonize gamers. I don't, I don't understand why we would go and like put tags and try and punish a media or a person for how they, what they like to do. Matar says he now plays six hours a week versus the six hours a day he played when he was younger. In Phoenix, I'm Karin Yoharo, Cronkite News. The Entertainment Software Association, an organization that represents many U.S. gaming companies, issued a statement in response to the WHO's release, which says in part, quote, Gaming industry leaders worldwide are urging caution regarding the WHO's new classification as it may lead to misdiagnosis of real mental health conditions. Getting a scholarship to play in Division I basketball is not easy. For someone who battles a potentially debilitating muscle condition, it might seem impossible. 
I met with future Marist College basketball player Kendall Crick to see how she overcame a rare condition she's had for nearly 10 years. When Kendall Crick was eight years old, she told her dad she didn't want to play basketball anymore because she thought she wasn't good enough. Being that little, I thought, you know, she's probably just doing something wrong or, you know, it's coming out of her hands too early, whatever. But um, she goes out to the ba uh, basket out front and um, she literally can't shoot the ball more than a couple feet out of her hands. Kendall's inability to shoot the ball stemmed from a condition called dermatomyositis. According to the Mayo Clinic, the inflammatory disease causes muscle weakness that gradually gets worse if left untreated. For Kendall, handling her symptoms wasn't easy. She credits sports for keeping her on the right track. Playing sports kind of helped me more through like the mental aspect of it. It helped me continue just pushing through and like having that schedule of I practice this day, this day, this day. It kind of just helped me continue and know that like, like I have to get through this, you know, it kept me going. Now, even after winning three straight titles with the Sentinels, the Seton Catholic Prep Varsity Girls basketball head coach, Karen Self, says that the strides that Crick has made on the court are nowhere near as impressive as the strides that she's made off the court. The biggest growth thing for Kendall is just realizing that it's okay to talk about this. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not, it's not your fault. Like, you were just you know, developed an autoimmune condition. There's nothing you can do about that. With Kendall's condition under control, she accepted an offer to play Division I basketball at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York earlier this year. Crick is currently attending Marist summer workouts leading up to the start of the school year. No university compares to the University of Arizona when it comes to giving student athletes with physical and mental disabilities the opportunity to suit up and compete. Our Sam Hoyle went to the Wildcats Adaptive Athletics Facility in Tucson to see what they offer. That's right, Emily. Situated on the University of Arizona campus in Tucson is a facility that's helped countless athletes hone their skills for the last 42 years. Four-time Paralympic medalist Shirley Riley attributes much of her success to the University of Arizona's Adaptive Athletic Program. This place has so many opportunities to grow. Um, like I said, they have everything we need here. The Wildcats program, which began in the mid-1980s, enables student athletes with disabilities to participate in six different competitive sports, including track, basketball, and rugby. While adaptive athletics are very prevalent here at the University of Arizona, the adaptive athletics interim athletic director, Peter Hughes, says that the fact that adaptive athletics aren't more commonplace across the country is something that's pretty troubling. When you talk to my, my other uh, counterparts in, across the country, it's really upsetting to us that uh, a state like California does not have adaptive athletics. They're, they're losing the opportunity to teach young men and women with disabilities to, that want to be competitive and want to play for, a, play for a, a university this opportunity. It should be afforded to everybody. While all six Pac-12 schools in California or Arizona offer some sort of recreational level of adapted sports like goalball at Cal Berkeley and adaptive tennis at UCLA, U of A is the only one of the six that offers a program that competes at an intercollegiate level or above. The 33-year-old Riley is currently escalating her training to compete in her fifth straight Paralympics, the 2020 Games in Tokyo. To find out more about the University of Arizona's Adaptive Athletics program, head to drc.arizona.edu forward slash athletics. Sam Hoyle, Cronkite News. In 2016, the center began offering fitness classes in the sport that made Ali an international icon. Barrow started the boxing classes to help improve patients' quality of life with drills similar to those that helped Ali float like a butterfly. But a year before the classes began there, a local Phoenix boxing gym owner dedicated his work in the ring to helping people diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Reporter Stephanie Shields tells us how a Scottsdale couple inspired Marty Barrett to use his boxing skills to help others. Bob and Roz Wattel were married for 49 years when Parkinson's disease ultimately claimed Bob's life in March. But before he passed, Roz found Bob a unique form of Parkinson's therapy with the help of Marty Barrett and the sport of boxing. Working with Marty was a real up, and it was the thing that he looked forward to during the week. Marty Barrett, who once trained with Mike Tyson and Floyd Mayweather Jr., owns 12th round boxing gym in Scottsdale. While he trains people of all ages and levels of fitness, 
Bob Wattel inspired him to learn more about boxing's effect on Parkinson's. As I spoke with his doctor and found out that there were more people, and as I started to educate myself in the disease and the symptoms of the disease, realized that there was a place for me to be able to help individuals. Today, Marty and his staff train about 60 Parkinson's patients. Training includes a light jog or walk, numbered punching sequences, and even sparring. It's been able to focus my attention and to keep moving. And moving is so important because uh, if, if you allow Parkinson's to get a hold on you, you're, you, you deteriorate. The gym rate is $109 monthly, but Marty says he doesn't let that price keep any of the fighters away. With the help of Bob's family, he created a scholarship fund to help pay for those who want to try boxing for their symptoms. Someone says, well, what's the price? And you can see in their face that they, they're hoping that it's something that they can afford. Um, so often we say, well, this is the price, but you pay what you can. The boxers develop a strong bond with Barrett. He would visit Bob Wattell's home to train him there, and he spoke at Wattell's funeral. I think that they were a wonderful team. Yeah. And I'm really grateful for Marty. Parkinson's patients training at the gym are grouped together according to, to their severity of their disease. In the Broadcast Center, Stephanie Shields, Cronkite News. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Cronkite News. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.